Hello, I'm Frank, Head of Monitoring and Auditing Legal Affairs at Scope Europe, as well as the Managing Director at its primary Selbstregulierung Informationswirtschaft, also in short as RIW. I'm honored to welcome Dr. Carlo Pilz, awarded lawyer, reputed expert on IT law, including GDPR, blogger, and member of the Complaints Committee of the EU Cloud Code of Conduct, the first ever fully operational Code of Conduct under GDPR for cloud services. Um, such an expertise is certainly perfect match for today's discussions, and this is around the first-hand experience of a GDPR implementation, the high expectations, and the rather low delivery rates, um, as at least as some may call it, and the resignation by some companies, but also to talk about alternatives that reach both the motivation of industry and the protection of data subjects. For the latter, we may also touch on what complaints committee's purposes and tasks are, and in this vein, let me first start with the question number one. Since GDPR came, became effective almost five years ago, uh, the data protection landscape has evolved across the EU, and uh, while some ambiguities in the regulations are being resolved, others emerge as a result of key stakeholders' decisions, which you may consider statements and guidelines, court decisions, and also the authorities, and partially those decisions and statements can be argued as being inconsistent. Um, in this regard, is there a need for more consistency in practice, respectively, in overcoming those uncertainties, especially that given European small and medium-sized enterprises may not have the resources or even the motivation to take a risk or address the matters in courts? Yeah, definitely, that's a good topic. Uh, I think if you ask controllers or processors uh, which have to comply with GDPR, they all will say, yeah, we need consistency. And to be fair, I mean, this was one of the main goals of GDPR, to have one law across the European Union with consistent rules, consistent obligations. And um, as we see now, after some years, there are some deficiencies in the law and we m might now look for the failures in the law or we might also look into practice um, what you mentioned, the different approaches of interpretation of the law by courts, by authorities. Um, I think that's a fact that we have this inconsistencies in application of the GDPR. On the other hand, I think we also have to be true to ourselves that to a certain extent, GDPR already included this in uncertainties because if you look at certain provisions, um, we have this vague uh, formulations in the law where nobody knows what it exactly means in practice. So to a certain extent, already the lawmakers on the European level, I think, had in mind that we need uh, one way or another consistency mechanisms uh, in practice. Th thank you in this way, and um, you also touched about the intent of, of the law. I mean, it's a regulation, therefore it should be fully harmonized. Um, but on the other hand, you also uh, touched on the element that certainly 27 member states, different authorities, different courts, there might be inconsistencies. and. The law certainly provided for some mechanisms to, to get rid of that one. There is certainly the consistency mechanism between the authorities, which is driven by the authorities. So as long as the authorities are not willing to, to really resolve the inconsistencies, um, the practice will not be able to resolve that. Um, but do you also envision some, some alternatives to that consistency mechanisms and maybe also something where the practice, the businesses, the data subjects, those who are actually affected by GDPR can start driving those consistencies? Yeah, um, as you mentioned, one major factor is overcoming inconsistency or coming to a consistency within the authorities on the European level, which we currently see in the decisions from the European Data Protection Board, which is, uh, as you mentioned, between the authorities. Where we still see inconsistencies would, for example, be on the court, court decisions in European uh, member states. For these decisions, of course, the consistency mechanism would be, if you will, European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and uh, with the final binding decision. And, and then we have like the th third pillar, which is well, controllers and processors, so the companies which have to apply the law for their legal practice and application of the law, where in practice, yes, they are looking for, for if you will, help. And, and any kind of feature which would help them to apply and practically implement those uh, partly vague 
provisions of GDPR. And um, also for this kind of question, GDPR, the lawmaker, if you will, um, they had certain solutions in mind. And there are uh, various solutions. One solution would, for example, be uh, the, uh, certificates under GDPR. Uh, as a possibility, or also another solution would be the creation of code of conduct for certain sectors, for certain, uh, uh, or by representative bodies, for certain uh, uh, economic sectors and companies, maybe controllers or processors, who would be able, via these, if you will, guidelines for these sectors, to implement GDPR in practice with more legal certainty. Which leads me to, to kind of second element on this one, um, which is legal certainty on the one hand, but also on how to overcome the uncertainties and to create certainty. And uh, certainly if we go a bit deeper on the interpretation, you may agree and uh, certainly you're also open to disagree that in practice there are some stakeholders that apparently go for very extreme positions because they have in mind a certain individual case which may have been related to a specific very profitable sector and then the argument is very easy to make yeah you have to do xyz because money isn't an argument there is sufficient money in that sector but as gdpr is a one size fits all it's neutral regarding the processes and the controllers also the small and medium sized enterprises would then have to apply exactly that solutions um, so do you see a kind of trade-off between the partially very strong requirements that can be risen by specific stakeholders and the implementation rate and the let's say motivation and potential resignation of small and medium-sized enterprises? Yeah, definitely you will see this in practice that the smaller companies, especially those companies which are active uh, in not so data sensitive fields, for example manufacturers who only only process uh, personal data of their employees. I mean, they will definitely have to apply GDPR, but from their point of view, it, applying GDPR is perhaps something like paying taxes or, or uh, applying with tax uh, legislation and laws. So um, it will not be a wet dream for them to comply with GDPR. Um, uh, just to give you a, a glimpse of what I experienced with uh, small and medium sized companies when or before GDPR applied, um, I was touring uh, in the region here in Berlin and Brandenburg and, and uh, holding small lectures, information events on GDPR and at the end I was always talking with one slide about the fines. Because as we know also, if you're a small and medium-sized company, of course fines have to be proportionate, but there's a possibility that you get fined also as a small company. And um, one guy stood up and he didn't ask anything about complying with the law or complying with certain obligations under GDPR. He, he just asked me how, how would it be possible to avoid fines and, and that was like really an experience to me where, where I saw, okay, the, the, the small companies, they are not thinking about how can I best comply with the law, but how can I evade the law and the legislation. And that's of course, from my point of view, not, uh, or I hope it was not the intent of the legislator. And um, what we see in practice is just GDPR, at least to most uh, extent of its uh, uh, obligations, applies to all controllers and processors equally. And uh, in practice for the small companies, it's a burden um, for several reasons. One reason might also be a misunderstanding of GDPR in practice. Uh, that's, that's really an issue uh, that some tend to over-exaggerate the obligations and say that's not allowed, that's not allowed, um, that's a problem in practice. But definitely, I would say for the small and medium-sized companies, GDPR is, is not their favorite topic. Although it could be uh, with a practical approach, practical implementation in practice. And, and you were touching on, on an element uh, like companies try to simply ask the question, will I be get fined, yes or no? And without 
blaming the data protection authorities. I mean, they, they're raising this element by themselves very vocally recently, and I totally agree that they may lack the official resources they are uh, due by the law. Um, that certainly results also into kind of lack of enforcement. I, I, I remember that one data protection authority once said, if they would start assessing every company on their uh, territory, it would mean one assessment every 40 years. And that was already very optimistic. So in, in practice, giving this little notion on, on resignation, um, one might say, okay, when the requirements are kept irrationally high, for practice, not for legal reasons, um, this might end up that small and medium-sized enterprises will actually don't implement anything at all, or even the bigger companies, because they will simply face the situation, let's bring it to court and let's fight the game. Um, you also mentioned that very often the resignation results from a misconception of GDPR, uh, and very easily expert could tell them, if you do X, Y, Z, little notions, then you're already compliant. In this respect, you mentioned also codes of conduct and, and the mandatory monitoring under that one. Do you feel that sometimes it could be better for data subjects to have more pragmatic, but then broadly adopted implementation than theoretically perfect requirements, but no implementation on the market at all? I mean, your question is already hinting to, to, to one answer, um, um, but I would say yes, of course. Um, practical and a pragmatic uh, implementation of GDPR would always be better for data subjects, maybe an access request or a request for the deletion of data. If the small, medium-sized company knows what to do in two or three steps, uh, it's of course better. And we have to keep in mind that data protection is a right in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, so it's relevant also for small and medium-sized companies, yes, um, but it's, it's, it's a doable task in, in practice. And for me, also many disputes in practice between data subjects and the companies arise out of no fundamental knowledge or not the uh, uh, enough knowledge of complying with GDPR in a pragmatic way, in a pragmatic approach. Many, many disputes between data subjects and companies, which then ultimately go to the data uh, protection authorities, could be handled in a very pragmatic way, um, but both sides may tend to go to like extreme positions both on both sides uh, with misconceptions of GDPR and that's unfortunately what we see quite often in practice. Yeah. Okay, and, and then like taking the lessons learned of, of all those questions that we had and also coming back to, to your role as a member of the Complaints Committee of a Code of Conduct. Um, in practice, keeping in mind that the authorities' enforcement pressure might be a bit of lacking, therefore we might have white spots, blank spots in practice. Where do you see actually the benefits of actually having first a code of conduct from, from the variety ambiguity perspective, but also specifically from the enforcement perspective? Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the uh, positive effects uh, of a code of conduct, I would definitely, I mean, you can already just look into GDPR and what GDPR says with regard to code of conduct, what is the purpose of a code of conduct, is to formulate rules for certain sectors, um, how to apply the partly broad definitions and terms in GDPR for certain, situ or in certain situations in a certain sector, how to really like factually apply the regulation. And I mean, that's already a big win for many companies. If, if they look into GDPR and they read a very long sentence, mainly based on uh, legal language, um, in practice many people or many companies uh, without, for example, uh, legal departments don't understand what it means. And so such a code of conduct with like explanation, okay, what do I have to do? How do I have to transpose that? obligation with a broad wording into practice, that's already a plus, definitely. Yeah, so that's on the side of the content of the Code of Conduct, what can the Code of Conduct do? And with regard to the enforcement aspect, 
I think the interesting and uh, also positive aspect for practice is um, uh, with regard to code of conduct is that you have an independent body which is monitoring compliance with the code of conduct. Of course, in practice, um, you can always have a, a, a counterpart in, if you're uh, 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 discussing data processing agreements, for example. Um, your counterpart, the big company, the big service provider, will tell you, yeah, that's all GDPR compliant, that's fine. Uh, of course, you as a customer, if you have the possibility to negotiate, then you have to trust that that's the case, that it's GDPR compliant. And if you're not of that opinion, you may take the risk or you may choose another service provider. With a service provider opting for a code of conduct, you have a third party in the room, monitoring body or complaints committee, which is monitoring the behavior of that service provider, of that uh, member, and I think that's definitely a plus. Yeah. And, and, and given the, the approach of that one, so the, the monitoring by its mere term is, is then rather something that's considered to happen continuously, frequently, or is it just a one, one off situation where it's. No, I think we have into GDPR, and uh, already GDPR foresees that with uh, the relations, for example, between controllers and processors, it's a, a continuous monitoring which has to be done with regard to the relationship. Maybe because the the processing activity changes, maybe security measures change. So uh, that's definitely something which has to be monitored. And also, uh, that's uh, one good example where a code of conduct can give you some guidance with regard to the monitoring. How is it done? It, uh, in what kind of in time intervals? And th th that's uh, also a plus in practice. Okay, and, and you, you're referring also to the term complaints committee, and I guess complaints by data subjects, by companies, can be another trigger next to that mandatory monitoring. But also, I can imagine that being a complaints committee member, or be, having a complaints committee, might also help to resolve certain practical needs within that code of conduct. Uh, so is, is there a kind of involvement of, of a complaints committee in that actual application of codes of conduct? Uh, that's also definitely a, a positive aspect that it does not always have to be like a a complaint and then fining or reprimanding a, a, a member or service provider, um, but it can also be like also a continuous monitoring of the code of conduct itself. What could be done better in the future? How could one rephrase certain sections, certain obligations within the code of conduct? So. It's on the one side, it's the, the service provider who has to uh, uh, comply with the code of conduct, monitoring of the service provider. On the one side, it's also, if you will, like a self-monitoring um, within the, the, the system of monitoring body and complaints committee. And over time in the future, of course, improving the code of conduct itself. Thanks on that one. And then maybe my very final question, which is, giving you the chance of a wish come true to be phrased uh, on a short term and midterm. So um, we, we've touched on the potential lack of enforcement, on the potential situations to drive consistency within the European Union on application of GDPR. You've tackled on some practical needs by the small and medium sized enterprises that are simply standing there and have question marks in their minds. So keeping all that in your um, consideration, what would be your wish or what should be the next steps under GDPR under these mechanisms to really help practical implementation and the protection of data subjects? Um, I think what we have to acknowledge is that un under the current GDPR, current GDPR, we will always face inconsistencies and different interpretations and that's fine, uh, otherwise I would have less <laughs> work and, um, and also the Court of Justice has to do something and uh, some work with GDPR, that's okay. But sometimes um, my wish would be that with regard to, to certain very, uh, I, I'm confronted in my, in my daily practice sometimes with questions where I think it's impossible that no one has raised that question or the interpretation of a certain term in, in GDPR and that there's no answer to that question. That's impossible, but it's possible under GDPR. And um, I think one wish would be also to foster acceptance of GDPR 
on a broader level within the small and medium-sized companies and, uh, and their sectors um, to go for practical approaches, may it be via code of conduct, may it be via certificates, may it be via guidelines by authorities. I mean, we have several tools in our toolbox, um, but that's something where we can perhaps solve the most relevant practical questions and tackle these and then go for the big ones and leave these for us lawyers or for the courts. Um, and I think that, that would be a possible uh, way forward in the next, uh, in next years. Thank you very much, Carlo. It was a pleasure to have that interview with you. And let's see when we have the next one. And until then, have a prosperous 2023 and also very good times as a lawyer. And uh, hopefully not those big questions that cannot be resolved in practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.